Lord. Okay. That wasn't the most enthusiastic hallelujah I've ever heard. I guess it, it'll do. It'll do. Good morning, everybody. Praise the Lord. That's a little better. I mean, if, there, if there's any place that you're going to say hallelujah with any um, enthusiasm whatsoever, this would be the starting point, wouldn't it? You know, I mean, there are plenty of places that one might say hallelujah and uh, want to just simply revel in the glory and goodness of God. But good morning, everybody. Praise the Lord. Yeah, all right, we got to warm them up. That's got to work them a little bit, right? Okay, so this is um, this can be an interesting morning because in that we have the baptism and we're real excited about baptizing friends um, and celebrating their salvation, really, and their testimony as to what Christ is up to, what he's doing in their life, what, how he's changed their life and how he's working in their life. So uh, this is always a very interesting and rich and blessed Time to be together, and I hope that you will, uh, when we're done with this portion of the service, head back that way, back to the pool, because um, that's where baptism is happening. Um, I, I was about to cancel baptism once I found out the, the Giants are playing at 1 o'clock. I mean, come on. We're talking priorities now at this point. You know, like, what's, what's more important to me, baptizing people or the Giants-Jets preseason game? Come on. So anyway... But no, we are going ahead and we are going to baptize. We did have one little problem. Um, My pool heater broke down about three days ago. So, you know, the pool's like a a nice warm, maybe like 62 degrees or something like that. No, it's not. We've had some nice warm weather here, so I think we'll be in pretty good shape. But it'll just be one more jewel in your crown. You'll get the badge, the cold baptism badge or something, you know. When we get it, you'll, you'll, you'll have your thing to wear. Yes. Pools said jewel should not be heated. Okay, not pools. Okay. Thus saith jewel. Okay. But anyway, with, with baptism in mind, um, I wanted to, and it's just that it's amazing to me um, when, you know, you kind of put something together and then it seems like everything else is kind of playing right into it and working right into it. That's exciting. And that's um, what we are essentially going to, uh, to do here. I'm just kind of like, I want to take a look at two pictures. Uh, and, and this kind of plays into the whole baptism idea. The, the concept underlying these um, two images, well, there's a bunch of images, but two particular pictures that are given to us in the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the, uh, that's the appropriate name, by the way. It's, uh, it's not Revelations. It is the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ, because that's what that last book is. It is revealing Jesus Christ. It is unveiling apocalypsis to, 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 take, the, to take the veil off or to take the cover off. And what th- that last book, the final book in the Bible is about is not revelations. I, I have to go off on this, but, but it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants things which, was, which must shortly come to pass. And then in that first chapter, of course, in that book, we have the Lord Jesus himself being presented as he has never been seen before. You know, John knew Jesus well. John is recorded in his own book or by his own testimony as the disciple that Jesus loved. And he and Jesus were, he's the guy with his head on the Lord's chest at the Last Supper. But when John sees Jesus in Revelation chapter 1, he says, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He could not handle the glory of the glorified Christ. It just blew him away. Um, And so this is, if, if you're thinking that the Jesus who's coming back will be anything like the Jesus who was crucified and checked out of here 2,000 years ago, that's very wrong. Because when Jesus comes back, he will be an awesome a, and fearful figure um, from whom those who are not right with him will run. They will flee the presence of Almighty God. So anyway, we're, we're going to take a look at two pictures in the book of Revelation. One is going to be found for us in Revelation chapter 4. The other is going to be found in Revelation chapter 22, 21 and 22. And just submit, I, I want to show you a couple of pictures along the way, but let's do this. Let's ask God to put his blessing on this and kind of take it, because obviously it doesn't work unless the Holy Spirit takes it and 
you know, takes it home. So, Father God, we come into your presence today. I thank you so much for this gift of music. What a treat to be able to sing songs and play instruments and clap our hands and, and shout your praises. We just thank you for um, giving us this exalted privilege to do this together, to worship you. And it's just a foreshadowing of something that um, is going to be our inheritance forever, to be your people, to be your children, to be your family, and forever to celebrate life and creation and all that you have made together with you and to explore it and to experience it. Oh, what a future we have. So, Lord God, as we study this morning and as we take some time to think about what's in your word, we just pray that you will open um, it to our own heart and spirit, open our spirit to it. Take these things, O oh God, and just sow them deeply into our life so that we will have that which we just sang about, Jesus at the center of it all, that whatever it may happen to be with all the many different activities and interests and functions and things that go on, that you yourself, O oh Lord, would be at the center, just like you put us at the center of your life and made us your priority and laid down your life on our behalf. So we bless you. Thank you and praise you for your, your goodness, O oh God. Bless your word, we pray this morning in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. all right. So we're going to go to a couple of different places in the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. I think we are. There we go. All right. So let me, let me set this up a little bit. Um, in chapter 1 in, book of, in the book of the Revelation, um, we have Christ's glory being revealed and, and this picture of Jesus before whom um, John just falls down as though he had died. And then uh, chapter 2 and chapter 3 are seven letters to seven churches. So it's, a, it's specific to these seven churches. These seven churches were actual geographical towns and locations in Asia Minor. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, um, Philadelphia, Laodicea, all actual cities. You can go there today. You can take a tour. You can go to all of them and see the ruins and all that. Um, they were actual, literal cities within that Asia Minor area. Asia Minor area. John um, was the bishop over that group of churches. Churches, and Jesus has a message. And there's there's lots in there that maybe we'll explore some other time. Uh, so after we get through chapter two and chapter three, chapter four, so, um, that, and that's where we are right now. We're at chapter four, verse one, and we're going to take a look at this. What I want you to to think about as we're doing this this morning is this is a picture of heaven for us, okay? It's kind of like something is opened up for us, and then we get a chance to look at what's going on in heaven. And, uh, and, and I, I want to do this in order to show there's a very interesting contrast between the picture that we're going to see in Revelation chapter 4 and the picture that we're going to see in Revelation chapter 22. So, um, let's, go, uh, let's go into the scripture. Here's what John writes. After this, this is four chap uh, chapter 4, verse 1. After this, I looked, and there was before me a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once, I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby. A rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center 
around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. All right, so in, in order to like maybe uh, create a little bit more of an image, I, I found a couple things. Um, I've used these before uh, online. Some, some pictures. Now, again, anybody who would try to draw this would have quite a time. You know, all these things are, they, they kind of, and, and other things that are coming up, I mean, it's just, it's, it's beyond human comprehension and all that. However, uh, some people have given it a shot. So here's a picture that someone has rendered, um, which presents to us that scene that was just described for us in Revelation chapter 4. And there you see the one, someone who sits upon the throne. Obviously, it's the Father. There's the green emerald all around. Then you see in front of, they're showing you, um, it, like they're all four kind of gathered in front. You see those four faces. You see the face of a, an ox there in the face of a man, the face of an eagle, the face of a lion, uh, the wings. Um, and then you see around the outside, there are these elders, okay, 24 of them, and they represent something. All of this is symbolic and has a spiritual and, and biblical or, or a, um, re- spiritual um, significance um, that is being expressed in some type of symbolism. <clears throat> so, There's the throne of God. There's these four living creatures who are just mind-boggling. And then these elders that are around. And and whenever these living creatures kind of go off on praise, the four living, the the, uh, 24 elders, and they represent like the number 12 from the Old Testament, the 12 tribes of Israel, the number 12 from the New Testament, 12 apostles, kind of like the the full, 12 is a biblical governmental number. And, and, and shows the completeness of government. And so this is kind of a picture of the ultimate seat of sovereignty and authority, okay? And whenever uh, the, uh, the four living creatures begin to worship God, okay, yeah, here we go. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne, and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne, and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Now, a couple more images. Okay, so here are the elders on one side and the thrones. And then whenever the uh, four living creatures begin to give honor, glory, praise, and thanks to God, they all fall down. And um, another image, okay, of these elders as they, as they take their crowns and they lay them before the very <coughs> throne of God. <coughs> now, that's an interesting picture. It's one that we're probably fairly used to. We sing about those things, um, kind of bring them into, into uh, some of our, our hymns and our songs and stuff like that. It's kind of a, an interesting image. But what I'd um, like to ask, I guess, is if, if that's the picture of heaven, I have a feeling that it's not all that appealing. I mean, that would be... That would be interesting to watch that and see that. But if that's it, so what's going to happen is I'm going to die, and then I'm going to be up there, and that's going on. And that's going to go on for all of eternity. Okay, so these beasts are, Bill says, cool. 
All right. and, and I'm sure that like you can get a front row seat, you know, and you'll be right there. But, and I don't mean to be in any way disrespectful um, at all, but just that like the idea of going to heaven and just kind of being forever prostrated in front of the throne, not that God is not worthy, of course God is worthy, not that I am worthy to be within, any, within the same universe that God is. But it just seems like, is that all we're going to say? Is that what it's all about? Yeah. The first What's that? Just for the first million years. All right, Bill says it's just for the first million years. So, <laughs> okay. <clears throat> but again, I'm not, I'm not in any way wanting to be disrespectful of this, of this wonderful scene. But again, it, it, and, and it's, I've, I've certainly thought about it many times. I love, I love the King James where he says, um, for you created all things, and for your pleasure, they are and were and have been created. And, and I've, I've often just felt the application, you know, I, what is the purpose of my life? To bring God pleasure. That is the whole purpose of life. There are a million other things to attend to, but if you and I will just devote ourselves to say, I don't want to please God. That doesn't mean i got to do anything bizarre or weird or be a weird person or anything. It just means that God loves it when our heart is tuned to be the kind of person with character and who loves the things that he loves and who hates and shuns the things that he hates. So anyway, so if that's the whole picture... Um, but it's not the whole picture. That's the thing. And so we're going to go to the end of the book. And at the end of the book, there's a very different picture. So let's... All right. Now we're going to Revelation chapter 21. This is uh, the New Jerusalem. So all kinds of things have happened, but we've gotten to this point in the unfolding of the redemption story. And now here we are. And, and this is what God ultimately has in mind to do. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city. Uh, do we? Okay, that's, I don't have that on my thing. Okay, let me go from there. The angel who talked with me had, a, oh. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Hello? Okay, the angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length, and as wide and high as it is long. The angel measured the wall using human measurement, and it was 144 cubits thick. The wall was made of jasper. And, in, and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass, the foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. Okay, so here's this image of um, what's going to be, okay? And this is the new Jerusalem. I saw the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, adorned as a bride. Now you... Um, how many could t how, how many could how many could tell me how how long is a stadia? Right? Who knows? Right? Well, twelve thousand stadia translates into fifteen hundred miles. So think about that for a second. So this city that's coming down, where the redeemed will live, this thing is fifteen hundred miles long, fifteen hundred miles wide, 1,500 miles high. It's, an, it's, it's incomprehensible, right? And you kind of get somewhat of a picture because when John sees it, he says, I saw the holy city of God coming down out of heaven. So apparently, you know, this thing now is somewhere out there and it will then touch down and this will be the city of the, this, this is where we will spend the rest of e eternity. This will be like the center of everything, okay? Another, another image just to get a feeling, okay? That's what that city would look like if it were placed upon the United States of America. 1,500 miles is a pretty big city, <laughs> to say the least, right? Here's uh, one more picture of that. 
It just looks a little strange and seems, again, I don't want to be irreverent in any way, but I mean, this is what we just, what was just described for us. This incredible city that comes down um, adorned as a, as, a, as a bride for her husband. So now we're getting into this next picture, okay? And let's keep on going with the, the text. I did not see a temple in the city. Because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light. And the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory, their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Important point. Must not bypass this one. Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? You say, how do I do that? Do I make an application? Do I get online or something like that? When you come to Jesus and receive him as who he is and accept what he has done, your name, you become then a believer and your name gets written in the Lamb's book of life. When you accept that Jesus is in fact God's, he is, he is one with God the Father, he is the Son of God, and that he came into this world to offer his life, to give his life as a sacrifice for the rebels and the sinners that we are, so that we might be won back. When that happens, that's when your name gets written in the book of life, when you accept the fact that Christ died for your sins. Okay? So, here we have um, <clears throat> this, this next picture. One more, one more piece of, of, oh, no, no, we didn't finish it off, did we? Oh, yes, we did finish it off. Okay. Sorry, I usually get a chance to try all this stuff out on the 9 o'clock people. You know, I, whatever things I'm going to botch up or mess up, I do it then, and then we give you a slightly more polished version of the whole thing, right? Um, but anyway, okay, so we, here we have um, this picture um, of this new city of, of Jerusalem and, um, and, and, and the glory of the nations. Uh, there's, there's many other places that can be referenced, Isaiah 65, Isaiah 60, Ezekiel 40 through 48, other places where these same ideas are kind of brought forward. And it's kind of like John gathers them all together. There's, very, there's a lot of Old Testament in this book. And so John is gathering all these apocalyptic pictures and pictures that have to do with, the, uh, with eschatology and last things and last days and all that stuff. And John kind of puts it all together, and he is uh, painting a picture for us. Okay, so here's the next section. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations, which is an interesting thing, because nobody's going to be sick up there. So whatever healing of the nations, whether that has something to do with just bringing all of us together. You see, look at all the discord that's in our world right now because of the alleged racism, pervasive systemic racism that, that some say is everywhere, you know, and, and, and all, the, all the tension and animosity that gets stirred up over that. But perhaps there's something in this that will then just kind of, some kind of a healing balm in this fruit, 12 crops every month. Um, it's a, uh, uh, no longer will there be any curse. The throne of, throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and the servants will serve him. They will see his face. His name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. So here's a picture of, or someone's rendering of all of this, which, again, would be quite challenging. But And you see that... that 
in, in this picture, what we see is the throne of God, but we're not seeing the same kind of setup in, the ter- in terms of the throne and the four living creatures and then the elders and the worship happens and everybody hits the deck and you know what I mean, like that whole thing. Here we have like the throne of God and, and what John raises out, coming out from the throne of God, there's like a little stream. And then he goes and checks it out. That stream is like ankle deep. And then he goes a little further down. And he gets to be, you know, knee deep. And then, and then it's waist deep. And then it's like, it's swimming water. And, and this water of life, this river of life is coming forth from the throne of God. And, then, and as this river proceeds, and ultimately it will proceed all the way to the Mediterranean, and, and will make the waters of the Mediterranean fresh. And there's all, you know, he writes all kinds of things in there about what that's going to do to things at that particular time. But you see on either side of that river, there are, there's the trees, presuming those are the trees that are the trees that will bear the fruit, that will heal the nations. But just, again, I'm just uh, showing you this. Here's another kind of a picture that might be kind of similar to what our imagination pictures when we think of the new Jerusalem or going to heaven or something like that. Let's see, is there another one? Um, no. Okay, so if the, it, since the book is giving us these two very different pictures, why? What's the difference between these two things? What's the difference between the one where everybody is, boom, they're down before God and they are in obeisance, worshiping before God, taking their crowns, throwing them before the Lord, and the, the difference is that in Revelation chapter 4, there's a war going on. And everybody wants it to be clear whose side they happen to be on. Okay? That's really the heart of the whole... And, and like Jewel read that thing we were seeing this morning about um, submission. The idea of surrender. That's what's being portrayed in Revelation chapter 4. It's not as though God's some kind of megalomaniac that just needs everybody to worship him and has to have all of this, has to have his ego stroked, you know, by everybody just telling him how great he is. It's it's not that at all. It's that there is a world in rebellion. If you remember a couple of, well, probably a month or two ago, we were doing Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage? The people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth have set themselves. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against his anointing, saying, let us cast away their cords from us and throw their bands away from us. Change of scene. He that sits in the heavens will laugh. The Lord will hold them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his... The, The point simply being that we live in a world that is totally locked into its rebellion against God and against Christ. And it requires a surrender to be able to make it out of this world. There must be a surrender to the lordship of Jesus and to the redemptive plan and purpose of God in order to be able to get to that, right? A lot of people just think that's just a given, I'm just going to die and I'm going to be in heaven and drinking all my drinking buddies up there and all my friends and stuff. Nope, not going to work out that way. The only way a person is getting into heaven, has, and, and that's why that picture is so solemn in chapter 4. And, and the rest of 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, all the way up through 21, it is describing the war that's going on. Right? It's all visions and, and symbolic pictures of the conflict and the beast and the antichrist and things that are going on between you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the people of God being uh, martyred. And uh, you know, like that, it, Revelation, the book of Revelation is, is giving us this story. And so right, at, right off the bat, when we first see the image of heaven, it is this image where people are, boom, down. And that is the, the reason I bring this up is that is the appropriate posture for a child of God. You know, right now, there will come a time when we will be there. Oh, is that something to look forward to? Huh? We will live in this city. I got the thing I just showed you, 1,500 miles cubic. Holy mackerel, right? 12 different levels of the thing, 1,500 miles high, mind-boggling, incomprehensible, no doubt. But this will be our city. This will be where we will spend. This will be where we essentially reside and live, and the Lamb will be there. The Lord Jesus will be there. God will be there. I'll be there. (laughs) I feel like Scrooge. I'm here, if you remember that famous line. Anyway, enough. 
So the point being that, and, and the point to bring home is, have you surrendered your life to Christ? Because that's what this is in its heart. That's, if you want to know what is being a Christian, it is in its essence. Is it going to church? Ah. Is it reading the Bible? Ah. You know, uh, is it being a nice person? Ah. It is surrendering your life to the Lordship of Jesus. And just as Jewel read before in that, in that uh, lovely little, little poem, and will read for us again, that's the heart of the whole thing. And it, like, you, oftentimes we speak of singing as worship, right? And we say, we're going to have worship this morning. And, and, but singing doesn't even touch this. It may, I shouldn't say that. It may touch this because you may be singing out of a joyful, exuberant heart, singing and thanking God and praising God. That may be you. I hope it is. It certainly is what happens in me when music starts and, and some wonderful song gets sung and I'm on board. I'm, I'm into it. Um, but that is not worship. Worship is this. That's worship. And there's no substitute for it. It is putting it all on the altar, and it is saying, Lord Jesus, whatever you have for me, I receive with a grateful heart. And so this morning as we have uh, a baptism, a baptism is a, a big part of this because a baptism is a statement. I have come over from death into life. I have come over from rebellion and disobedience to integrity and faithfulness and obedience. Now, of course, does anybody get this thing perfectly right? Of course not, right? Does everybody, this, this old rebellious, self-driven, self-absorbed nature is still with us for the time being, but praise God, one of these days that'll be done too. And we will no longer drag around this ungodly ball and chain of a personality and a, and a nature that we have. And we will never even think of any way to do anything except how can I please the Lord more? How can I show the Lord how much I love him? How grateful I am for what he's done for me. So that's, a, that's the message this morning. Right now we are on the side of submission. We're on the side of surrender. And there probably are things, I know there are things in my life for sure. They, there are always things that are coming up to be laid down before the Lord and uh, to let Jesus be Lord and have control over. Amen? But the result of all that is God's grace increasing on your life. Grace is not a static, frozen condition. You come into it. It says grow in grace. Grow in grace. Grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, the minute when you come to Christ, yeah, you're in grace, meaning you stand. When you come in Jesus' name, you stand before God in a, in a status of favor. God says, what, what, do you, what do you want? I'm here, Lord, because of what your son did for me. What can, okay, come on in. It's like I've, I've, I've said many times, if some kid walks into my house at dinner time and says, what's for dinner? Hit the road, pal. But if some kid walks in with my son, and my son says, hey, uh, Dad, this is my friend Bob. Can he have dinner with us? Oh, for sure. You're my friend. You're friends with my son. That's the ticket, that we've come not on our own, or because of what we've done, because of what, who, we, who we think we are. But we have come because of what he has done on our behalf. And so the ticket right now is, sur is surrender. And that's really what baptism is about. Baptism is a statement. If you, um, you know, when, when Paul writes in chapter 6, he says, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into his death, so that like just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God the Father, even so we also should walk in a new kind of life. That's the ticket. So this morning we celebrate the surrender of our baptizees or whatever the proper terminology is for, for you guys, but delighted to have you here, delighted to, to really have this privilege 
to share this, this glorious moment with you. And if there are others here and you have not been baptized, I would, again, you, you've got to review all this stuff. You've got to ask yourself, is your name written in the book of life? Have you repented of your sins? Have you trusted Christ as Lord and Savior? Have you acknowledged the, the magnitude of what it is that he did on your behalf? Have you received that and found salvation through Jesus Christ as Lord? Hallelujah. So let's uh, close it with prayer, and then we're on our way over to the pool. And again, I want to encourage you to, to drop by and celebrate with those. Who, they're, they're, this is always one of the greatest services that we have, I think. Right? It, it really is because there's just a, a sincerity and a truth, and, and just it, it's, it's wonderful to hear people tell their story about how Christ has come into their life and changed them. So maybe just before I pray, Jewel, would you come back up and honor us by reading? Now it'll be, it'll be more meaningful now. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed, employed for you or laid aside for you, exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and wholeheartedly yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine, and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant now made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen.